Greetings, colleagues from the Kent Northwest Kidney Center. Uh, this month, we'll discuss the role of dialysis adequacy. That is, how well are we cleaning the blood of our dialysis patients? How do we know if we are doing a good job? And how important is it that we reach certain adequacy targets? This in service has three objectives. We'll review measures of dialysis adequacy, specifically KT or V and urea reduction ratio. We'll discuss their limitations. And finally, we'll review causes of and ways to address low adequacy. Let's begin by talking about what dialysis adequacy actually is. As you all know, there are two basic objectives of dialysis. One is the removal of waste products, and two is the removal of fluid. Now, both are important for keeping our patients healthy, and today we will focus primarily on the removal of waste products, although these two objectives are actually closely related. Interestingly, we operate under the generally accepted idea that the amount of dialysis that a patient receives and the amount of so-called uremic toxins that we remove can impact morbidity and mortality. That is, the better we clean the blood, the better our patients will do in the long run. As we'll discuss later, this may or may not necessarily be true. Now, there are several types of waste products removed during dialysis, and these are known collectively as uremic toxins. But it's a heterogeneous group, and it includes small water-soluble compounds such as urea, protein-bound solutes such as indoles and phenols, as well as large metamolecules such as beta-2 microglobulin. Now, the assessment of solute removal during dialysis has always been based solely on urea removal, so the removal of these small water-soluble compounds. This is a problem because evidence from experimental and clinical studies points to an adverse effect that middle molecules and protein-bound solutes have on patient survival. So the current way in which we assess adequacy ignores this effect. So if a patient is not well dialyzed, he or she may have symptoms which we attribute to the accumulation of waste products. These are known as uremic symptoms, and they include nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, itching, and severe fatigue. So why not just dialyze patients according to symptoms? That is, dialyze them until they feel better. Well, uh, it's generally not recommended because the dialysis dose that reduces uremic symptoms is suspected to be lower than the dose shown to increase survival. And also many of the symptoms, such as fatigue associated with kidney failure, are thought to be due to anemia, which can just be corrected with evogen. So it's thought that symptoms don't tell the whole story. So how do we quantify how well we are cleaning our patient's blood. This brings us to today's topic of dialysis adequacy. As I previously mentioned, all methods used to measure dialysis dose are based upon urea clearance. Um, although the best method is not known, most nephrologists use KT over V, but we also use something called URR or urea reduction ratio. Let's first focus on KT over V. KT over V is generally accepted as the preferred method for measuring dialysis dose. It is a calculated value based on the following variables. K stands for dialysis or dialyzer clearance, defined as the volume of blood completely cleared of a given solute per unit time. T is the duration of dialysis in minutes, and V is the volume of body water of a patient which represents the distribution of urea. There are actually several formulae used in calculating KT over V. I'm not going to show them because they're not important, but I do want you to know the variables that go into the calculation. They include pre-dialysis BUN, post-dialysis BUN, the duration of dialysis, and then the volume of fluid removed. So if you have these uh, four variables, you can calculate KT over V. Okay, so in order to accurately calculate KT over V, you have to measure the post-dialysis BUN correctly. 
This is actually harder to do than we think because the timing of the blood draw is very important. This is because the concentration of urea in blood samples drawn from the arterial exit, that is where the blood leaves the patient and enters the dialyzer, increases for approximately 30 minutes after dialysis ends. Why is this? Well, we'll talk about that momentarily, but basically if you check the BUN right at the end of dialysis or you check it five minutes later, 10 minutes later, or 20 minutes or 30 minutes later, uh, you're going to get a different value and that's going to affect your KT over B. So the BUN rises in a patient during the 30 minutes following dialysis for three reasons. Um, first, uh, is because of a dissipation of hemodialysis access recirculation. So this occurs in all patients. Basically, it refers to when dialyzed blood returning through the venous needle gets sucked up into the arterial needle and goes back through the dialysis circuit rather than returning to the systemic circulation. So a certain amount of blood uh, makes a little loop in between the two needles and gets cleaned over and over and over again. So that makes the measured BUN artificially lower than it actually is. Second, because of dissipation of something called cardiopulmonary recirculation. Um, this occurs when dialyzed blood uh, goes from the dialyzer back into the patient to the heart and lungs, and then the heart pumps it right back to the arm where it gets dialyzed again. So it basically bypasses the systemic circulation. So a certain percentage of the already clean blood returns from the heart right back to the fistula, uh, which again makes the measured B when entering the dialyzer artificially low. And finally, uh, because of something called equilibration of urea from the extravascular compartment to the vascular compartment. So in other words, uh, there's a lot of urea inside of cells, so the extravascular compartment, um, and uh, this urea equilibrates uh, back into the blood over a 30-minute period after dialysis ends. So all of these reasons account for the B1 being artificially low at the end of dialysis. It takes about 30 minutes uh, to accurately measure BUM uh, in order to accurately calculate the KT over B. So if you calculate KT over B using a BUM that's measured 30 minutes after dialysis, you achieve something called the equilibrated KT over B or the so-called double pool KT over B. It's the most accurate measurement of the KT over B because again, it's using an equilibrated BUM obtained 30 minutes after dialysis ended. But can you imagine the pushback you would receive from your patients if you asked them to sit for an additional 30 minutes after dialysis in order to measure an equilibrated KT over B? It would be horrific. So instead of asking our patients to wait an additional 30 minutes after their dialysis treatment to more accurately measure the BUN, we instead measure BUN at the end of dialysis and calculate something called the single pool KT over B. How do we do this? Well, as you all know, we slow down the blood pump to 100 mLs per minute for 15 seconds and then stop the pump before the blood sample for BUN is drawn. The purpose of this is to um, decrease the contribution of access and cardiopulmonary recirculation. Um, so the KT over B calculated based on the, uh, the BUN at the end of dialysis is the non-equilibrated or single pool KT over B. The equilibrated or double pool KT over B is lower than the non-equilibrated single pool KT over B since the urea concentration measured with the equilibrated sample is higher than that actually observed in the non-equilibrated sample. The difference is approximately 0.21 for the usual range. So if, say, someone has a KT over V of, a single pool KT over V of 1.4, uh, that would be an equilibrated KT over V of 1.2. So KT over V is far from a perfect method of quantifying how well we are dialyzing our patients. There are many limitations that we need to understand and appreciate. Um, first, um, the equation K2 V was derived uh, years ago uh, in a much younger dialysis population with fewer comorbidities compared to contemporary dialysis population. It is also developed in an era when um, the filters uh, for dialysis uh, were mostly cellulosic dialysis with small surface area and small pores. And now we use large pore high flux uh, dialyzer membranes, which remove much more molecules. So allows for much better clearance, but shorter dialysis treatments. 
As I mentioned earlier, uh, KK Urea relies solely on the clearance of one single solute, which is urea. It ignores potentially larger waste products and protein-bound waste products, which are potentially toxic. It also measures urea clearance in a single session, and it assumes that that one session is representative of all other sessions. So it doesn't account for mistreatments or shortened dialysis treatments that may occur during other sessions. KKRV is also prone to measurement error. So if we don't time the post BUN correctly, then our KT over V calculation will be incorrect. Another significant limitation of KT over V is the fact that you are dividing clearance by volume. And so if you have a really small volume, like a really small person, uh, it's going to overestimate how well we're cleaning the blood. Similarly, if you have a really large person, it's going to underestimate how well. Uh, and it can't distinguish between skeletal muscle or fat or malnutrition. Uh, and it's really tempting if you have a small patient to uh, reduce their dialysis time because their KT over V is really high. And that can actually lead to under dialysis despite a high KT over V. Uh, the calculation of KT over V also doesn't take into account the contribution of residual renal function. So if someone still makes urine and still has some clearance from the native kidneys, uh, this is very important. It's probably actually uh, one of the best predictors of longevity on dialysis. In this one uh, observational study of 32,000 dialysis patients, they found that the mortality risk associated with KT over V was actually attenuated uh, by a greater residual renal function. So uh, if you made a lot more urine, uh, you lived a lot longer. And that wasn't captured by the KT over V formula. Um, and finally, KTRV doesn't factor in other variables which may affect patient outcomes. So, for example, the frequency of dialysis or how good of volume control we achieve or their hemodynamic stability during the dialysis run. So, there's actually a lot of factors that affect mortality um, more than just urea clearance. Another simpler way to estimate dialysis adequacy is something called the urea reduction ratio or URR. Uh, URR is closely related to KT over V. It refers to the fractional reduction of urea during a single dialysis session. Formula is 1 minus the post dialysis BUN divided by the pre dialysis BUN. So, for example, if your pre dialysis BUN is 50 and your post dialysis BUN is 15, the reduction is 70%. So it'd be a URR of 70%. Um, there are several limitations to using urea reduction ratio as an estimate of dialysis adequacy. For starters, it's simple to calculate, but it's less accurate than KT over V because it assumes that urea volume of distribution remains constant during dialysis, that is, that we are not removing fluid. But if we remove fluid, we are actually removing urea. Um, and a large ultrafiltration requirement alone can raise the KT over V by 0.2 without affecting the urea reduction ratio. Um, urea, again, is just one of many potentially toxic molecules, so it doesn't necessarily represent uh, middle molecules or protein-bound molecules and their effect on dialysis uh, adequacy or how a patient does in the long run. Um, <clears throat> it reflects the clearance during a single session that doesn't necessarily uh, take into account missed sessions or shortened dialysis treatments that may occur other times of the month. Um, of course, you have to estimate or you have to measure the B1 correctly at the end of the dialysis session to get an accurate URR value. Um, and finally, uh, you can't use uh, URR accurately in patients that dialyze more than three times weekly. Because let's say you dialyze four or five times weekly. Well, the initial BUN at the start of those dialysis sessions will be lower, and it'll look like your urea reduction ratio is smaller, but you're just dialyzing more often. So why exactly do we use KT over V and URR? Well, we can credit the National Cooperative Dialysis Study in 1980. This was the first randomized control trial to investigate the impact of dialysis dose as reflected by urea removal on patient outcome. They looked at 160 dialysis patients who were randomized to different adequacy targets, so-called time average urea concentrations, and different treatment times, like two and a half to three and a half versus four and a half to five and a half hours. In the study, urea concentrations were measured over time so that a 
average concentration of urea for the treatment session could be expressed as tank urea or the time average urea concentration, basically the area of urea underneath this curve. The study showed that high urea was associated with increased morbidity, hospitalization mortality, and low urea was associated with reduced morbidity. There was a trend towards a benefit from longer dialysis, but was not statistically significant. Uh, and likely that we would have seen this had there been a larger sample size or had the study been longer. So the study authors concluded that patient morbidity and treatment failure are related to dialysis dose, specifically urea clearance, but not dialysis duration. This is an important study that shed insight on the importance of removing waste products and yet has had some unintended consequences. First, it served as justification for shortened dialysis treatment. So as long as the urea reduction ratio is good, well, why not reduce the dialstration to as short as we can make it? If we can dialyze a patient for two hours uh, and dialyze more patients during the day, that's a great thing. And second of all, we now use a number to decide how well a patient is dialyzed rather than clinical parameters such as how people feel. I mean, a patient can have uh, acceptable adequacy and still be uremic. And so now a patient can come to you and say, hey, I don't feel well, but you can say, hey, but your adequacy is good, so you're fine, which of course is uh, suboptimal care. So assuming that we use K2 RV as our measurement of dialysis adequacy, what target is acceptable? Current guidelines recommend a minimum single pool K2 over V of 1.2 for patients and a target of 1.4. If most dialysis patients in a unit don't achieve a K2 over V of 1.2, then CMS may uh, implement a financial penalty on that dialysis unit. The problem is that these recommendations are based on a paucity of data. Retrospective studies have suggested that a KT over V equal to or greater than 1.2 is associated with better survival, but there are no randomized studies to support the minimum dialysis requirement of KT over V greater than or equal to 1.2. Significantly, targeting a KT over V of greater than 1.4 does not appear to improve survival or reduce hospitalization rates, and this was shown in in a very important study called the HEMO study. It came out in 2002 and it was conducted between 1995 and 2001 in the United States. It looked at almost 2,000 dialysis patients who dialyzed three times per week and they were randomized to either standard dose of KT rear of 1.2 or a high dose KT rear of 1.65. And at the same time, they were also randomized to either a low flux or a high flux dialyzer in a two by two factorial design. Average follow-up was 2.8 years, and the two groups achieved a significant separation in KT over V, so the KT over V for the standard group was 1.32, and average KT over V was 1.71 for the high-dose group, but there was no difference in death, uh, risk of death, hospitalization, time to hospitalization for first infection, or decline in serum albumin. And these results were subsequently confirmed by the Membrane Permeable Outcome Trial in 2011 uh, and the EGE Trial in 2013, both randomized control trials. So delivering or achieving a higher KTRV target does not translate into better clinical outcomes. Similarly, in peritoneal dialysis patients, higher KTRV does not appear to translate into better clinical outcomes. This was shown in the Animex trial published in Jason in 2002. It's a prospective randomized control trial of almost 1,000 peritoneal dialysis patients in Mexico who were randomized to either standard prescription of CAPD with two liter fill volumes four times a day or high dose uh, with a PD clearance of greater than 60 liters per week. Minimum follow-up period was two years. The primary endpoint was death. And what they found was that adequacy was significantly higher in the intervention group but it didn't translate into better clinical outcome. So the authors should include, as in the HEMO study, that small solute clearance does not appear to impact peritoneal dialysis survival. So why does a higher KTRV not translate into better clinical outcomes? Well, no one knows. 
Maybe it's because we're focusing on small solute clearance but ignoring larger molecules such as the middle molecules or the protein bound solutes. Or maybe optimal volume control is much more important than clearance. And again, this is not taken into account in calculating KT over V. As an aside, we monitor KT over V on a monthly basis. This is simply based on tradition um, and not because of data. Uh, however, there's a paucity of data to support that monthly intervals is actually helpful. In fact, there was one study in Canada in 2011 that found no difference in mortality, hospitalizations, cardiovascular events, or frequency of hyperkalemia between patients who underwent routine laboratory testing at six-week intervals rather than monthly intervals. Let's now talk about some of the causes of inadequate dialysis. Uh, Coyne published a study in 1997 looking at almost 400 hemodialysis patients in Missouri, found that 93 had a low KT over V, 40% were due to a lower than prescribed blood flow or duration of dialysis, 25% due to excess recirculation, and the cause was not determined in the remaining patients. However, when they rechecked the KT over V, they rapidly returned to baseline values without any intervention. Other causes of low KT over V include an increased body mass. Remember, we take KT and we divide it by V, and if the V is very large, that will decrease your, your adequacy estimate, um, give you an artificially low estimation of how well we're cleaning the blood. Maybe we're not dialyzing people with a uh, high enough dialysate flow rate, maybe we're using a needle gauge that's too small, or maybe we're using catheters. Uh, catheters are associated with more recirculation than fistulae. So what assessment should be performed if a patient has low KT over V? Uh, it's important to look at the fistula. Access problems are a very common cause of inadequate dialysis. If someone has a stenosis uh, or a narrowing in the blood vessel, then recirculation uh, is a common problem. We need to look at treatment duration. Sometimes the dialysis time may end up being shorter than prescribed. So we may prescribe four hours, but the patient may frequently become late or want to get off early uh, or have some you know, technical problem, frequent alarms that uh, shorten the dialysis duration. Um, it's important to review the technique of drawing the post-BUN, post-dialysis BUN accurately. Uh, need to look at the dialysis machine variables like uh, the blood flow rate, um, the dialysis is being used, Dialysis, cl dialyzer clotting is important. If we don't give a patient enough heparin, then the dialyzer may clot, and so you can clot off the small pores uh, in the capillary tubes, uh, and then you lose surface area for diffusion. Cardiopulmonary circulation, as I mentioned, um, essentially this allows the dialyzed blood delivered to the heart to then be pumped directly back to the arm and go through the circuit again without actually going to the peripheral circulation. So it's important to recognize that patients with heart failure uh, oftentimes have cardiopulmonary recirculation, uh, and the only way to compensate for this is to increase the time on dialysis. Then finally, inadequate or fluid removal. Um, some clearance is achieved by removing fluid. So if the patient isn't taken off enough fluid, um, then clearance could be lower than expected. What are potential interventions? Well, we could always increase blood flow or the dialysate flow rate. Can consider using a larger dialyzer, one that has greater surface area. Uh, I'm a big fan of increasing dialysis duration if we can accommodate in our unit. Uh, and finally, it's very important to preserve residual renal function. Uh, how much urine a patient makes, this is very important uh, for long-term patient performance and survival. So in summary, the amount of dialysis that the patient receives and how well we clean the blood may affect long-term morbidity and mortality. KT over V is a preferred method of measuring delivery dialysis where K is the dialyzer clearance, T is time, V is their volume distribution. Uh, there are many limitations, uh, including the fact that we're focusing on just small solute clearance, ignoring uh, middle molecules and protein-bound solutes. Um, we measure KT over during one session, uh, assuming that it applies to all sessions, but the patient <coughs> um, may not, for example, show up at all sessions or may shorten other treatments. Um, uh, you have to measure the post-BUN accurately. Uh, we tend to overestimate uh, clearance in malnourished or smaller patients and underestimate uh, clearance in larger patients. It uh, doesn't take into account residual renal function, doesn't take into account volume control or hemodynamic stability or other variables that may affect outcome. 
Uh, there's no universally accepted target value for the KT or V. Um, per current guidelines, we use a KT or V of 1.4. Uh, there are no randomized controlled data to suggest that higher um, KT or Vs are better clearance, translate into better clinical outcomes. We typically measure KT or V once a month by convention, but not because it's data driven. Uh, and finally, patients who have a KT that is below target um, should undergo an access evaluation uh, and a review of their dialysis prescription, particularly with respect to dialysis duration. Okay, everyone, take a deep breath and brace yourself for the monthly quiz. What are the two main functions of dialysis? Excellent. Remove waste products and remove fluid. Today we focused on the removal of waste products. What are the symptoms of inadequate dialysis? Excellent. We call these uremic symptoms and they include nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, itching, and severe fatigue. Name three limitations of the use of the formula KT over V. There are many, many limitations. They include measurement error if you don't um, draw the BUN correctly at the end of the dialysis session, overestimation in smaller patients, underestimation of clearance in larger patients, uh, doesn't consider residual venal function or other important factors such as volume, frequency of dialysis, among others. Uh, and it's unclear if higher KT or V translates into better clinical outcomes. Uh, current randomized control studies suggest it does not. What did the HEMO study show? Well, if you paid attention to the last question, you would have gotten this one right. No difference in mortality between high and standard KT rate. So you could increase someone's KT rate uh, from 1.3 to 1.7, and it didn't translate into uh, a reduction in mortality or fewer hospitalizations or better albumin or anything like that. Last question names three causes of inadequate dialysis or a low KT rate. Excellent. Uh, fistula problem, so specifically a stenosis that causes recirculation, low blood flow rate or low dialysate flow rate, small needle gauge size, among others. This concludes the in-service for the Kent Northwest Kidney Center for the month of May 2022. Uh, you guys are wonderful. I appreciate everything you do, and I hope you have much better than an adequate day. This is Andy Brokenbro signing out until next month.